Tonight on KQED Newsroom, the high profile ghost ship warehouse trial comes to a sudden end. Acquittal for one defendant and a mistrial for the other. Also, the next Democratic debate is next week. Is the Democratic Party too fractured to beat President Trump? We're going to hear from Congressman and former presidential candidate Eric Swalwell. And it's opening night for the Warriors' new billion dollar waterfront arena in San Francisco. But it's not all glitz and glamour. Good evening and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Raj Mathai. We begin tonight with the verdict in the months-long ghost ship trial. This all stems from that warehouse fire that claimed 36 lives in Oakland in December of 2016. Yesterday, a jury handed down a mixed verdict. The jurors ruled Max Harris not guilty, but could not reach a decision about Derek Almena. Almena was the master tenant accused of illegally converting the building into a living space for artists and violating fire codes. Now, Alameda County Superior Court Judge Trina Thompson declared a mistrial for Almena. Both men faced 36 counts of involuntary manslaughter and up to 39 years in prison if convicted. Now with us now is KQED news reporter Don Clyde who was in the courtroom yesterday when that verdict was delivered and joining us via Skype from Cambridge, Massachusetts, UC Hastings law professor Hadar Aviram. Hadar, Don, thank you both for being with us. Don, let's start with you. Tell me about it. In that courtroom, you've been covering this trial since day one. What was the emotion in there? What was the impact when that when it was read? Even before the verdict was read, you could see pe uh, victims, family, relatives were crying. They were passing tissues amongst themselves. And when the verdict was read for Harris is not guilty, what really stood out to me was one woman in particular put her head in her hands and was kind of shaking back and forth like, I couldn't believe this was happening. There was a look of shock almost. People were expecting, uh, I think, uh, a conviction. When the mistrial was announced for Almena, there was a collective kind of gasp from the relatives of the victims, a real sense of shock that there was no conviction for Almena. So in that courtroom, walk us through this, there was the family and supporters of, Derek, uh, of the victims, of course. And then what was the jury's reaction? Because they had to read through a lot of things here. What were they doing? What was their, what was their expressions? The jury was relatively expressionless. They were, uh, they had, uh, the, the jury read uh, took a long uh, few minutes by the court reporter, and uh, there was not a whole lot of expression from the jury. Okay, and I believe there was one row of supporters for Max Harris and Derek Almana, their reactions? There was a number of, of, of uh, supporters for Harris in particular who, who had been there through many of the days of the trial. Um, they hugged and they cried and they, they were elated after the verdicts were read for sure. Harris. Let's, let's bring in Hadar Aviram with us. Uh, Hadar, your legal background here, were you surprised and, and, and I preface by, by, by saying nothing seemed to be surprising in this five-month-long trial, but were you surprised at that verdict? Not really. We know that this was a pretty difficult and complicated trial, not only because it's a trial pertaining to a horrible tragedy, but also because there are so many issues, social issues, political issues surrounding what happened here, that, that it was just so complex and it could really have gone any way. Uh, Hadar, what comes next? We know October 4th is this big date on the calendar when they go back to court in terms of Derek Almena. We know Max Harris walked out of jail, the Santa Rita jail in Dublin last night. But what comes next for Derek Almena from a legal standpoint here, that October 4th date? So there's a difference between an acquittal and a hung jury. An acquittal is basically the end of the line. If the jury acquits someone, and of course the jury is a black box, we don't know why they decided what they decided, that is it. The prosecution cannot appeal an acquittal. However, when we have a hung jury, that means that the jury was unable to reach a decision. In this case, from what we understand, 10 jurors were seemingly uh, uh, leaning toward convicting, two were leaning toward acquitting. They could not reach uh, a verdict in which case the case is dismissed uh, in legal terminology without prejudice, which means uh, the prosecution can retry the person. But the bigger question is, should the prosecution retry the person? Is it worthwhile? Is it a good idea? Is it the right thing to do? And all of those things will have to be decided within the DA's office, and there's also going to be a hearing with all parties to determine how, how to proceed. So perhaps a retrial. Would there be a possibility of a plea deal again? We reached one last year in this trial. It was thrown out. Could there reach another plea deal for Derek Almena? Absolutely. And in fact, this is one of the possibilities, that if the prosecutor is foreseeing a situation where, again, they're going to encounter a lot of hurdles in the trial, we know that this is uh, 
the jury that eventually uh, decided the, these cases is a is sort of a modified jury. We started off with three jurors that were then bumped off. They were replaced with alternates. There were many, many surprising things and many twists in the jury plot in this case. The prosecutor might not want to take that risk and might want to offer Elmena a plea and say, you know, here's a sure thing. You know, here's a lesser, a lesser penalty. You know, just take this. There's no trial. Less risk for the prosecution and less risk for Elmena. And Elmena might or might not decide to take a deal. Hadar, did the prosecution drop the ball here? Uh, District Attorney Alameda County, Nancy O'Malley, did she and her team drop? Did they lose this case? I think that without knowing what happened in the jury room, it's impossible to answer this question. Uh, and I think that um, what's special about juries is that as opposed to legal systems where there's professional judges, the juries don't have to explain why they did what they did. So we're never going to really know what happened in that room. And even if we hear from a juror or two what happened, we're never going to hear the, the story from the perspective of all the 15 people that were involved. And, and therefore, we're not going to know, is this some theory that the defense posited? We know that the defense was trying to advance uh, a theory that involves the complicit responsibility on the part of the city. We know the defense also suggested the possibility of arson. Uh, we also know that um, there are a lot of questions floating about, is this really the right thing to do? We know that at least in the context of Max Harris, uh, he was close friends with many of the people who died. And the tragedy is a tragedy for him as well. So, so is, is, is this the right thing? And one, one decent prosecutorial consideration is sometimes we don't prosecute people even if we think they're technically culpable because we come to the conclusion that they've suffered enough. Yeah, there so the there, could be, there could be all kinds of things going on here, and I don't think it can be chucked to one uh, uh, issue or another, the, the, the eventual outcome that we see. So, so many layers to the story. Don Clyde, let's get you back in here. Uh, so many twists and turns in this trial. You were there, boots on the ground. What happened with those three jurors, three female jurors, I believe, that was, that, that was taken off the jury a few weeks ago and replaced? Do we know the backstory here, why they were taken off the jury by the judge? They were re removed for misconduct on August 19th. Tony Serra, outside of court yesterday, he represents Derek Almeida, said that one of the jurors apparently had reached out to a firefighter who was not involved with the case and was seeking some kind of information. Strictly forbidden. Uh, it's not entirely clear how the other two were wrapped into this. They could have been communicating, but that was what happened. It created a level of stress because all of a sudden you had only one alternate juror remaining in this case. We see so much that tragedy, the 36 lives lost, but this is also a lot more complex than we talk about. We talk about just the gentrification in Oakland, across the Bay Area, across the country, but specifically here. A lot of artists live there. There's not just one ghost ship warehouse. There's a lot of similar warehouses in Oakland, right? That's exactly right, and gentrification is still a huge issue in Oakland. Costs of rent are, are increasing, especially since this event in 2016. I've talked to several KQED arts reporters and colleagues who said this is, um, the costs of rent have been so prohibitive that certain events and, and venues and, and places like the ghost ship are being further driven underground, which could create more safety issues. Hadar, let's get you back in here. Is this the only Onus now on Oakland moving forward in terms of how they supervise and legislate their their own city because yesterday uh, one of the lawyers for Max Harris said yes this is on Oakland now to fix the city when it comes to housing and and the question of course is what does fix the city mean because in some sense to now create uh, you know building regulation codes and, and more supervision and things like that is going to maybe of course save lives which is something that we want but I think many people in Oakland also don't want the special character of Oakland to go away. And uh, as we're seeing, it starts off in San Francisco, it moves on to Oakland, it's you know pushing uh, uh, out into, into the entire Bay Area. These are all issues that the entire Bay Area is going to have to contend with. The, the, the question of, of uh, does being safe necessarily have to come at the expense of losing character, or is there some way where we can all affordably live in these cities without them becoming basically museums for the rich. Sure. One last question, Hadar. Now we move forward with the civil lawsuit, and that's already in process, uh, in progress. Oh, what, do we, what do you expect to see now? So what well, the important thing to keep in mind is that even though a conviction in criminal law would have been useful for the civil lawsuit, the civil lawsuit can also proceed independently of the criminal lawsuit. Some of our viewers probably remember the civil suit against O.J. Simpson, who was acquitted of the murder of his wife, but then uh, was found liable in, in to, to pay damages. The issue here is that these particular two people don't have deep pockets nearly deep enough to even start to offer any sort of monetary compensation, even if monetary compensation for, for, for the loss of lives is even possible. 
So there are interesting questions as to if there's uh, pursuit of civil damages, shouldn't the civil damages address the various other parties that might be complicit in, in what happened here? Sure, and it might be some closure for those 36 families involved in all of this. Hadar Aviram uh, joining us from UC Hastings School of Law, Don Clyde from KQED. Thank you both for your time. Thank you. It keeps happening. On Sunday, a gunman in West Texas went on a shooting spree, killing seven and wounding 22 others, including a 17-month-old toddler. But this time, some change. This week, Walmart announced it would stop selling ammunition for handguns and assault rifles and would discourage its customers from openly carrying firearms in its stores. While the NRA denounced the move, others applauded it, including lawmakers such as East Bay Congressman Eric Swalwell. Uh, before dropping out of the presidential race in July, Congressman Swalwell made gun control a defining feature of his campaign. Congressman Eric Swalwell joins us now. He serves also on the House Intelligence and Judiciary Committees. Nice to have you in studio. Yeah, Good to see you. you. Yeah, you too. Uh, we will talk about gun control because you are really leading the charge in many ways about this. But first, I got to ask, uh, the next debate is next week, and you were just in the fire. Yeah. How exhilarating or how exhausting was that process <laughs> running for president? It's exhilarating. And, and, you know, you're on the stage with, you know, people that you admire. Some of them, you know, are my friends. Uh, so I've gone to the weddings of uh, three of the people who were running uh, for president, which was, like, a little bit weird to, you know, be on a debate stage uh, with some of them. But I ran for president primarily because I wanted to make ending gun violence a top priority. And I used that debate stage opportunity uh, to ask the frontrunners, uh, Vice President Biden and Sanders, if they would endorse my ban and buyback plan on assault weapons. And they both, to their credit, said uh, that they would. It was the first time they'd taken a public position on that. And our own uh, senator in California, Kamala Harris, without even being asked, said uh, she supported that plan as well. So I feel like, you know, it was a cup of coffee of a campaign. Uh, I wish I was still in it. Uh, but we did make our mark uh, on that issue. And other candidates uh, continue to support a ban and buyback. So I, I'm confident we're going to get there. It's great to have you just because we can analyze now, almost like a quarterback situation here, of what's going to happen Thursday, next Thursday in Houston, Texas, with this debate. What do you see as an analyst here, not yeah. as a congressman, yeah. not as a presidential candidate, but as an analyst, how is Joe Biden, Joe Biden vulnerable? What's his biggest vulnerability going into this debate? Well, I think you have to make a case for change. Uh, most elections, when you beat a sitting president, it doesn't happen often. It's because of a, a change election, right? And, and so you look, it was really just, you know, George H. Uh, w. Bush, uh, Jimmy Carter in, the, in, in our lifetime, uh, where that's happened. And it was change agents uh, who came in. And so, you know, being the stable adult in the room statesman is certainly something Vice President Biden uh, brings. But I think people want to know, like, how are you going to change, you know, the issue of gun violence? How are you going to change this economy that benefits folks on the top floors, but not most other floors? What are you going to do for the folks who have student loan debt and are just in financial quicksand? So and I think change thing? agents. And, and uh, is this what Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren, the senator, but perhaps among the many candidates, is that where they're going to, in theory, go at him? I think they're they're generational uh, change candidates, and also they are offering, I, I think, just a, a different uh, way of governing. But again. The argument for Vice President Biden, it's not a bad one, is that this president is a threat to the democracy. And you have someone uh, you know as a statesman who's an adult uh, and can handle these issues. And so it's going to be exciting to watch. One of these debates and of this presidential campaign season, and it's still next year, but it's already campaign season, was your clip, was your, your, your interaction with Joe Biden in one of the previous debates where you essentially said you went at him pretty firmly yeah. about passing the torch. We're going to listen to the clip. Sure. I want your reaction on the back end. Joe Biden was right when he said it was time to pass the torch to a new generation of Americans 32 years ago. He's still right today. If we're going to solve the issues of automation, pass the torch. If we're going to solve the issues of climate chaos, pass the torch. If we're going to solve the issue of student loan debt, pass the torch. If we're going to end gun violence for families who are fearful of sending their kids to school, pass the torch. Vice President, would you like to sing a torch? Pass the torch. <laughs> pass the torch. The front runner Joe Biden still has the torch. Yeah. What happens now? He does. And, and you know, he's on the debate stage and I'm not. So, you know, credit uh, to him. And this may not be a pass the torch uh, election. The, elec the electorate, it, it looks like, you know, really does see Donald Trump as, as such a threat that uh, I think they want to know with, go with someone they know. And you, you see that in, I think, Harris, uh, Warren, uh, and Biden. And that's why they're uh, hanging in there. But I, I still believe, though, that, um, you know, voters want to know what you're going to do uh, differently. Because a lot of these problems have 
persisted and have gotten worse. And, you know, even on climate, on student loan debt, on gun violence, Republican and Democratic administrations have failed to address those. So someone's going to have to convince the American people that something will be different. Is the Democratic Party hurting itself, shooting itself in the foot by, by going too far left? We saw this. You want to yeah. go historically in 1972 yeah. election. But you go so far left that you isolate everyone in the middle and Donald Trump takes the Oval Office again. You know, I, I really think so much of this election is going to be just about you know, exhaustion. Like, they're just tired of his crap, frankly, that it's just we can't continue to do this. Um, you know, this last week, I mean, he took a hurricane and, and somehow found a way to make it worse. And so, yes, I, I understand the concern about, you know, policies and going to the left. But I, I think a lot of this is just about, you know, maybe going back to worrying about our own jobs and not having to worry so much about the job that the person is doing in the Oval Office. Sure. Oh, and true. that's hard to measure, like, you know, exactly what policy will be favorable or not. I, I think a lot of this, though, is just, you know, the exhaustion that he's put us through. It, it could be. Yeah. It's going to be a fascinating yeah. know, several months ahead of us. Let's talk about uh, in, in terms of bringing out something to the table, your gun control. Uh, just this week, San Francisco Board of Supervisors declared the NRA, the National Rifle Association, quote, a domestic terrorism organization. Is that grandstanding or is that something, there's, there's some teeth there? They're enabling uh, domestic uh, terrorism. They are arming school shooters. They're arming church uh, shooters with the policies that they put forth and the uh, abso absolute inflexibility uh, to support any changes to gun laws. And then the do, you, do you agree with the I Board of Supervisors? Yeah, and, and I, That's a pretty heavy statement. Yeah. The NRA is a domestic yeah. terrorism organization. I would say it's leadership. Yeah, you know, I, I don't they're not even in line though with their members. And I don't think their members their members 70% of them support having background checks, yet their leadership uh, won't even support that and they fund members of Congress in such a way that they put this fear that there'd be a penalty to pay. But here's the good news, Raj. They are on the ropes. I saw running for president and working on the midterm elections that they are a vocal bowling tweeting minority. And that uh, if you can distinguish the noise from the signal and recognize that it's just, you know, a few people that really care about this issue and they're going to threaten you and they're going to bully you, but they don't represent the moms and the students and where most people are, you can find the courage to do what's right. We can talk about all these ideas, Congressman, but wh what's it going to take to get something done, whether it's you, your colleagues yeah. in the House, or the President of the United States? I would say we've gotten more done than we probably give ourselves credit for. So 17 NRA endorsed members of Congress lost in the last election. I credit that to the post-Parkland uh, groups that came forward and beat them in Kansas and Iowa and Texas. Uh, but also look at what the moms are doing right now. Moms demand action every day. They're saying, hey, we got Walmart, we got Walgreens, we got CVS, we got these different uh, retailers to say that they're not going to allow open carry uh, in their stores anymore. So we're not powerless. And then locally, I really think that in the past, Local jurisdictions like mayors and uh, boards of supervisors have been afraid to take on the NRA because you know you'll get sued and you may have a, a law that is lawful, but your city attorney or county attorney is saying, hey, look, if you do this, it's going to be millions of dollars of litigation against the NRA. We don't want to do that with taxpayer dollars. The NRA is spread so thin right now, I think we should put our you know, foot on the gas and, you know, start passing more laws locally. Very nice. As we wrap it up, what's next for you? I know you're going back to D.C. in a couple of days. Yeah. But what's next? Well, I'm going to continue to lead on this issue of, of gun safety and, and, you know, push my own colleagues in the Democratic Party to believe that we don't have to just incrementally take this issue on, that background checks should be the floor, not the ceiling, that we can ban and buy back assault weapons, have licensing, have insurance requirements, have red flag laws, hold manufacturers liable. Again, let's not be afraid of the NRA. Uh, we have momentum right now. Let's seize it. Thanks for your time, Congressman. Thanks for watching. Beginning tonight, San Francisco, specifically the Mission Bay neighborhood, will change forever. It's opening night of the brand new Chase Center, a glistening $1.4 billion waterfront arena built, financed, and controlled by the Golden State Warriors. But this is much more than a basketball arena. It's a new entertainment hub of San Francisco that plans to host about 200 events each year. Chase Center is also emblematic of current day San Francisco, a playground for the rich and powerful just down the block from homeless encampments. Joining me now, Warriors President and Chief Operating Officer Rick Veltz. Uh, before we get to all of that, welcome to the show and congratulations. I say this because getting anything done in the city and county of San Francisco can be challenging. I'm being polite there. Congratulations. Thank you. And I uh, would never miss an opportunity to hang out with you. Uh, 
But yes, any any project of this magnitude in San Francisco is uh, is has got some hurdles to cross. I can ask you this. You can answer me this for two hours, but for the <laughs> for, because of, of time purposes here, what was the biggest hurdle that you faced in getting this privately financed arena done? Well, I think we had to ensure that the neighbors were comfortable with the plan, right? We have a, our biggest neighbors, UCSF, who you know is operating hospitals and providing amazing medical care for people. The uh, whole biotech community that's grown up in that area and residents, you know, and it's now a big residential neighborhood. So, finding a path that everyone could agree on that would protect the interests of everybody in the neighborhood while at the same time doing everything that one of these amazing arenas can possibly do. That was probably the biggest challenge. Uh, you talk about Mission Bay and the Benioff Center and everything. I, I drive down there today, tomorrow, yesterday, and it's problematic and congested already. This is a question you've been asked over and over, but what is the real answer here of people just getting in and out before that central subway system, subway system is built? Yeah, well, it's 2019. All the great new arenas that are being built today are built in the most dense urban environments because that's the place that are the most accessible to the most people. And that's where they do the, the most for the communities in which they reside. So uh, I wish the Warriors could solve San Francisco's traffic problems. We can't. We have a lot of good ideas that will help people get there. Uh, we're a public transportation first building, and everything we message out there is to please take public transportation. Uh, it will get better over time. We're starting with Muni, and Muni has a stop right on the site uh, and has expanded and doubled the size of that. So we, could, we can load 1,600 people a time on four two-car trains uh, post-game, and it's free to ride on any event day. Warriors game, concert, whatever it is, your ticket uh, to that event is good for free, tra free transportation on Munich. Uh, Rick, it, it's a cultural shift, though, you're asking people to make. Because when I go to the games, I drive. My neighbors go to the games, they drive. We're in California. We're in the Bay Area. You're asking for a cultural shift here. Not only a cultural shift, but it's going to be an experience shift. Because at Oracle Arena in Oakland, uh, we were an arena in the middle of a giant parking lot on an interstate highway. So. Everybody arrived at the same time. There was nothing else to do except walk in the arena. If you want something to eat, you ate in the arena. That completely changes now. This is this is operating 365 days a year, and it's not just an arena. We're creating 29 retail, mostly restaurant opportunities on site over the course of this year, three and a half acres of public space, amazing public art to enjoy, and public transportation at our front door. So. Uh, you could arrive two hours early, stay two hours late, and have a completely different experience than what people are used to having. I grew up around here. You know the NBA. You've worked in the league for so long, from the front office down to the Warriors level as well. Uh, it just seems bittersweet leaving Oakland. Uh, Oakland was such a good, not only just a landlord-tenant situation, but the soul of the Warriors had so much to do with Oakland. Do you feel a, a little bittersweet leaving that community? And I know you're only going across the bay, but do you feel bittersweet about it? We spent a whole year celebrating our 47-year history there, and we're bringing it with us. So, uh, number one, the people. Uh, we didn't know how many people would come with us from uh, the audience we had at Oracle Arena to the audience we have at Chase Center, and we were thrilled that 70% of our season ticket holders are coming with us. So most of the audience is the same people that were in Oracle Arena. Uh, we launched something called our town jersey uh, three years ago, and we're going to continue to celebrate Oakland with our town jersey wearing that in San Francisco. We're creating a whole new court that just celebrates Oakland. Uh, we have a banner uh, that is Oakland 47 that will always hang at Chase Center to celebrate our history there. So yes, what about it's the, different. What about the vibe? You, you fear that you're going to miss out on the vibe of the East Bay compared because the Warriors games were special, you know that. You go outside after the game, win or lose, there's a DJ spinning, people dancing. Right. We're going uh, we're to feel that in San Francisco? Yes. So uh, if you want to have your bake sale Betty's uh, fried chicken sandwich, that's in Oracle Arena, that famous place. If you want to go to Belly Restaurant, which is famous in Oakland, we'll have a Belly Restaurant at that site. If you want a muralist uh, from Oakland, you'll find that in our main concourse. Uh, we're, we're always going to be the Bay Area's team. We want one foot firmly planted on the east side of the bay. And I don't know if you know, we're repurposing our former headquarters in downtown Oakland. We're taking our practice facilities and turning it into the biggest basketball teaching place for kids 
anywhere. Very nice. And, I we're, did not know and that. we're taking our business offices and giving those to uh, not for profits who are funded by the Warriors Community Foundation. So we have a headquarters in Oakland as well as what we have in San Francisco. You, you talk about community, we'll talk about, and you're a San Francisco resident as well, proud of it. Uh, just the juxtaposition, and this isn't an issue on you or the Warriors, but we're building this billion dollar arena, private wine cellar, private dining rooms, yet on the same street or on the same block, there's homeless encampments. How do, how do we approach this? Uh, this is a societal issue here. It is, and you know we are sympathetic as every other resident and every other business in San Francisco can be, and we know we need to do better. Um, that's not just the Warriors' job; that's our city's job. And you know the tax dollars that we're going to generate uh, are hopefully going to support a lot of programs uh, that will improve the life of people. As, as far as like you know this idea that the buildings for the rich, it's not. It's I talk about our, the MBA's Robin Hood theory of pricing, and that's that there are very few people who will pay an incredible amount of money for their tickets, which enables us to keep prices in the rest of the building much more moderate than they would be without those people. So uh, there's something for everybody there. Every seat at Oracle Arena has uh, like a restaurant or a club amenity associated with it. We serve exactly the same food on the main concourse as we do at the top of the upper bowl. So this is an experience that uh, we have to be sensitive because our fans are everybody, right? So we need everybody to be able to come to Oracle and enjoy Warriors games and concerts. You want to talk a little basketball? Sure. La last couple of sure. questions. What happened with KD? He leaves, he goes to the, to the team in Brooklyn. Uh, what was the last conversation? That, did he call up you or Joe Lacob or Bob Myers, the general manager, and say, guys, I'm out? Or did he Instagram it or text you guys? Yeah, no, that was a conversation with Bob Myers. Um, you know, we wish him well. He... Uh, We've won two championships with him. Uh, if one of the things I'm most proud about and I think is indicative of how we treat our players is that when you go to Oracle Arena, uh, or excuse me, when you go to Chase Center, I mean, uh, Joe Lacob has already announced that we're retiring his number 35 for the Warriors. And when you look at the original artwork, we have amazing art throughout the arena. You're going to see a lot of Kevin Durant. We're going to celebrate him forever. He was part of a team in two championships. Now, we did win a championship before he got there. <laughs> and the key guys on that team are still here. So so there, you know, I think there's a, I think we're better suited in the underdog role uh, than we are in a favorite role. And, and, and it's I think funny you we bring up that. the underdog role, and, I, and I'm guessing a lot of people around the league love the fact that you guys aren't going to be as dominant in theory with some key injuries to Clay, to Clay Thompson and yeah. so forth. Uh, but you guys still have to come at it. Yeah, we, and we will. And we're actually, our team is very excited what Bob Myers and his crew were able to do to retool immediately uh, after after KD's absence. We've got eight new players, but uh, we also have four All-Stars. No other team in the NBA is going to put four All-Stars out there in the court. Now, Clay will be sometime later this season, so if we can hang in there and be competitive the first half of the season when Clay comes back, I think we can make things pretty interesting for people in the playoffs this year. Rick, thanks for your time. Good luck this season. And oh, by the way, get out of here you got Metallica and the San Francisco Symphony at Chase Center tonight. I heard you're going. <laughs> I'll be there. Okay, <laughs> see you there. That's going to do it for us. As always, you can find more of our coverage at kqed.org newsroom. I'm Raj Mathai. Thanks for joining us.